Situated in the Indian part of the vast Himalayas, Ladakh is a land of lofty arid mountains, furrowed with deep valleys. It is also known as Little Tibet and the land of high passes. The men and women living in these high isolated villages and along the rivers dotted with glaciers emanate deep sincerity. Buddhism and its traditions are at the heart of Ladakhi culture. Still, the population is managing to adapt to the profound changes brought about by the region's recent boom. The inhabitants of Ladakh know that faced with nature, they have no choice but to remain humble and to make do with what she can offer them. A vast crowd of believers from the four corners of the Himalayas has gathered here at the Hemis Monastery for the Naropa festival. They are all followers of Drukpa, one of the major schools of Tibetan Buddhism. This huge festival takes place only once every 12 years. This branch of Buddhism is based on the teachings of Naropa, a holy man who lived in India in the 11th century. The festival is particularly lavish this year because it is also the 1,000th birth anniversary of Naropa. For this special occasion, the monks unveil a huge embroidered silk tapestry of the Buddha. It is the largest such tapestry in the world. His Holiness Gyalwang Drukpa, the 12th reincarnation of Naropa, leads the festivities surrounded by the dignitaries of the monastery. Through his progressive teachings, this spiritual guide encourages the monks and nuns to become shining examples and symbols of modernism. <laughs> Does it hurt when you cough? Yes, it, it hurts a bit in my chest. And do you sleep well? Not as well as I used to. In a tent on the fringe of the gathering, Dorje is giving free consultations. She is a Buddhist nun studying medicine. Since early morning, she's been treating a constant stream of people. What's your name? Sondoma. How old are you? 66. 66? 66. 66 years old. Four years ago, Dorji left her quiet monastery in Ladakh to study traditional medicine at a school in Delhi. I'm simply overjoyed. I'm so lucky to be able to learn this profession. It was my dream to become a doctor. Now I can make a difference. I can help people. Here, a prescription for your bronchitis. It's true I haven't finished my studies yet, but these consultations allow me to practice and treat patients. It's a wonderful experience. The pills and powders that Dorji prescribes are all made from plants found in Ladakh. The daytime is devoted to religious instruction, but at night the colorful festivities take over. The Naropa festival is a mix of traditional folklore, popular culture, and Bollywood-style dance numbers.
The lights of the festival have gone dark, and silence has reclaimed the mountains. Dorji has arrived back at her monastery, lost among the peaks of Ladakh. When she was 17, she decided to leave school to become a Buddhist nun, a profound and personal vocation. It was the choice of an altruistic life. Every morning, she goes off by herself to meditate for a few hours. Practicing meditation is very beneficial. Seen from the outside, it looks simple, but it is in fact quite difficult. If you don't meditate regularly, you don't make any progress. It's important to do it with sincerity. The path to illumination is long. You have to meditate for months and even years. It's like milk. First you have to milk the cow, then you transform the milk to finally obtain the butter. The basis of meditation is looking at yourself and controlling your own mind. Me, I'm still just a beginner. One, two, three, four, one. The nuns in Dorji's monastery practice Kung Fu, to be strong mentally and physically, but also to break down the outdated barriers between men and women. Traditionally, only men teach and practice this martial art. I stopped doing Kung Fu for four years because I went to Delhi for my medical studies. So I forgot a lot, and it's hard for me to keep up with the others. But I like it a lot, and I'm glad to get back to it. I really have to start again from scratch. It. One. Oh. Two, three, four. We just want to change one thing, you know, one thinking of the world that, you know, girls are not less than boys. We just want to go ahead than them. And we just, you know, want to, you know, I just want to say that uh, every girl, they have a power inside them. We just have to take it out with ourselves and go ahead. It doesn't mean that, you know, a woman has to always stay in the kitchen and cook something for their husband and everything or something, blah, blah, blah. We can do everything. Just the problem is we're not, you know, the, all the girls in the world are not getting a chance to do something, to show something, to tell something. So we're just, you know, like uh, giving a message to all over the world that give chance to girls, see what they can do better than boys. I can just say, Shumbi. Yum. Ciao. In a few days, Dorji will go back to Delhi to continue her studies. But first, she's going to visit her childhood village to gather medicinal plants along with three of her friends. I usually go back to my village once a year in the summer. It's the best season for picking medicinal plants. Otherwise, it's not possible on account of my studies. It'll be great fun collecting plants with my friends and seeing my family. Mom, how are you? Hi, come on in. Come. Hi, Grandpa. How are you? I'm fine. Please sit down. 
Mm. Grandpa, would you like some tea? It's with salty butter. Where will we go for the plants? We'll see tomorrow. We'll get up around 3, 3.30, and we'll leave around 5. I'm tired. My neck hurts. Dorji's village is perched up above 4,000 meters, the ideal altitude for what she's after. Medicinal plants are everywhere if one knows how to spot them. Hey, look! I think I found something. Oh, you know You see, that's it. This is Zava. Look, every part is useful. The flowers, the stem, the roots, each is used to treat a particular ailment. And we can mix it with other plants with different properties to make pills. Now, the younger generation puts its trust more in modern medicine. But by sharing this traditional plant lore, Dorji is keeping this body of knowledge from dying out. This one is Kemse. Show me. This is also a medicinal plant. It's good for treating back pains. So in a nutshell, the five main plants are Kemba, Umbu, Palu, Shusuke and Sepet. With these plants, we can treat wounds and minor pains. Medicinal plants are our country's precious stones. They grow where the air, water and soil are not polluted. All the plants we pick are natural and pure, so they've kept all their curative properties. If you grow them with chemical fertilizers, they won't be as effective. By studying medicine, Dorji is fulfilling herself as a woman and at the same time helping others. It was her dream when she decided to become a nun and it makes her mother very proud of her. I'm very happy that Dorji is studying to become a traditional doctor. It's a good choice because it's a noble calling. The only thing I want is for her to do well in this vocation, and I pray for that. It's time to say goodbye and get moving. Dorje is leaving Ladakh with this summer's harvest and heading back to her school in Delhi. See you next year. Goodbye. She still has three more years of studies before becoming a traditional doctor. My truck is like a little apartment. I cook and sleep in it. I even spend more time here than at home. Sure, I'm glad to get home and see my family, but I'm also happy in my truck because I get to see new places and travel. With his indomitable truck, Namgyal brings supplies to Ladakh's most isolated valleys all year round. Now, after a week on dizzying roads, he's heading home to Leh, the region's capital.
This city owes its prosperity to its strategic location between China and India. Back in the time of the Silk Road, Leh was a key stopover for the camel caravans. Now, with a population approaching 40,000, this noisy, dusty city continues to grow and attract villagers from the isolated communities higher up. Namgyal, like many Ladakhis, came to Leh looking for work when the state began to build roads to connect the valleys. At the time, they were recruiting drivers brave enough to handle construction trucks and tackle Ladakh's high mountain passes. Before he takes to the road, Namgyal buys the supplies he'll need for his trip. And now he'll pick up some really important items. Truckers in Ladakh have a very keen sense of style. Hey, my friend. Here, I'd like to buy one of these. Take your pick. How much? 100 rupees a pair. Do you have any in black? Let's go see inside. Okay, how much? 200 rupees. And I have a lot of nice stickers for you, too. Nah, I don't want any stickers. Come on. They're perfect for a truck. Look, a rose, really nice. And we have hearts. And this one, the Indian flag. It's great. What else do you have? Here, this, to clean your truck. Plus, you can use it as a clothes brush. Oh, come on, it's already broken, look. I have other stuff. Look, a solar lotus. How much for the prayer wheel? 400 rupees. So, what's the total? 1,500 rupees. Okay, I'll give you 1,000. Deal. Seeing as you're my first customer of the day. So long. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. How about this? Or maybe this? My truck is my work tool. And thanks to it, I can bring home the bacon. It feeds my family and puts my children through school. My truck is a Tata. I went to Jammu to get it in 2014. And then I drove it to Punjab to get it painted and decorated. Here in Ladakh, we like beautiful things. Hey, where are you off to? To the Nubra. See ya. Okay. From Leh to the Nubra Valley is only 120 kilometers as the crow flies, but the road trip is no walk in the park. There's a major hurdle, the Kardong La, a pass perched up at 5,360 meters. This road is known throughout India and the rest of the world because for a long time it was the world's highest motorable road. It lost its title recently to the new roads that the Chinese built in Tibet. I like this road, and I know it like the back of my hand. As soon as the truck is loaded up, you have to get moving. And even if I'm afraid sometimes, I have no choice. The trucks are high and wide, but even worse, most of the road is very narrow. In good weather like this, it's okay. But it is dangerous when there's snow. Namgyal has been running the Kardong La Pass for 15 years. Now he's one of the veterans, one of the few truckers who'll tackle this road as soon as the weather permits. Their courage and experience has earned them the respect of the other drivers. 
Personally, I'd rather drive at night. There's less traffic, and you can see the oncoming headlights. In daytime, you never know when a car is going to come barreling around a corner. Driving at such high altitudes is a real challenge. Above 5,000 meters, the lack of oxygen prevents the motors from running smoothly. The Kardong La Pass has its price. The trucks are dragging and wheezing when they make it to the summit. When I take the mountain roads, I pass by holy places, and I always string up prayer flags. Other people come here just for that, whereas I'm lucky enough to pass by these spots. They're on my way. According to the Buddhist religion, the wind caresses the holy prayers and scatters them to the four winds, transmitting their messages to humanity and the gods. A few kilometers beyond the pass, Namgyal makes a stop at his mother's village. How far are you going today? Down to the end of the Nubra Valley, Mom. Be careful. Drive slowly, my son. How's the family? Oh, just fine. My son has had all sorts of jobs. He worked as a messenger boy on construction sites. He was also in the army. He's always been the one to put food on the table. I can't remember if he got his elementary school certificate. <laughs> he left school when his father died because we didn't have any money. Sometimes I'll bring my mother some flour and fruit. There are no orchards here. We're too high up. Otherwise, I'll send someone to bring her some apples and apricots. I don't come through here very often, because right now, the shipments are going to Changtang and India. When I make a long-haul trip, it lasts at least 20 days. These high mountain villages seem frozen in time. Cut off from the rest of the world for a good part of the winter, these small communities of robust men and women come back to life in the springtime when the roads reopen. When he can, Namgyal acts as a messenger, bringing the latest news from the neighboring villages and from the capital. The Nubra River Valley, situated close to the Pakistani border, is one of the most well-preserved regions of Ladakh. With its lower altitude and milder climate, it is the orchard of Ladakh. Namgyal is coming into the final twists and bends. His trip is ending. He'll be able to deliver his shipment.
Hey, Stanson, how's business? All right, thanks. Here, that does it. What's new in Lei? Oh, everything's fine. No problems with the past? Piece of cake. Great. Thanks a lot. Call me for the next order. At the end of each day, I try to find a nice place to pass the night. Here today, somewhere else tomorrow. Hotels and restaurants, they're not for me. Before leaving the Nubra Valley, Namgyal stops at Diskit, a 14th century monastery clinging to the mountainside like an eagle's nest. Soon, Namgyal will have to tackle the Kardong La Pass again on his way back to Leh. He's praying and making offerings to the monastery to obtain the protection of the gods. He'll even have his truck blessed. The DAC is developed very quickly, but at the same time, we're losing our traditions and our culture. Personally, I think that such rapid change isn't a good thing. Too much progress kills our traditional values. I think it would be better if Ladakh remained Ladakh. Traveling at the wheel of his truck, Namgyal has witnessed firsthand the radical changes his country has been going through. A native of the mountains, he travels the length and breadth of Ladakh to earn a living for his family. Others have taken their destiny in hand and are striving to reconcile traditional society and development in this remote province of India. My name is Stanzin Dorje, but everybody calls me Stanzin Gia, because Gia is the village where I was born and raised. Having my village's name added to mine means a lot to me, because I'll never forget my roots. Life unfolds at a leisurely pace in Gia. This village is off the beaten path and has managed to preserve a certain harmony between the villagers, their animals, and the surrounding mountains. Gia is one of Ladakh's oldest villages. They've found traces of human activity here dating back to the second century BC. It's harvest time, and all through the village they're grilling the freshly picked barley. Then they'll grind it up to make a flour called sampa. There's a lot to do at this time of year, 
So Stanzen has come back to his village to lend a hand to his brother and sister-in-law. Nowadays, people are eating less and less sompa. They'd rather eat rice and wheat, which are subsidized by the government. However, there are a few villages, like Gia here, where the farmers understand that it's important to consume local produce. So they've gone back to growing and eating sompa, and it's gradually becoming the staple food. Until the age of 15, Stanzen was a shepherd along with his sister. Then, when he still could hardly read or write, he left his village to pursue his education. Since then, he has traveled widely in India and abroad, and he would like the whole community to benefit from his experience. We've recently started growing sweet peas here. The problem is that the seeds are expensive because they come from Kashmir and Delhi. So, to be self-sufficient, the farmers keep seeds from the harvest to sow the following year. They don't have to buy them anymore. And peas grow really well here. Stanzin is fighting to improve the everyday life of these villagers. He has an ally in this undertaking, his friend Christiane Mordelet, a French woman with a passion for Ladakh. Their goal is to reorganize the community based on sound, sustainable farming methods. Together, they founded an association of the region's shepherds and a cooperative run by the women of the valley's four villages. The farmers and the shepherds are in fact completely interdependent. And if the shepherds disappear, so will the farmers. And then the village will disappear. So they need a little bit of help from all sides to try to re-establish a new constructive connection and mutual respect among all the concerned parties. The women are certainly proud of what they're doing. And so are we. Et puis nous aussi. Stanzin is now 39, and he has become Ladakh's first documentary filmmaker. Whenever I come here, whether in summer or in winter, it immediately reminds me of a story. 
Before my father died, a lot of nomads would come to sell salt in Gia, my village. I asked my father, where does that salt come from? He told me that there was a lake high up, Lake Sokar, and the salt came from there. I was 13 or 14. Thank God, I've been lucky enough to travel, but every time I come back here, it makes me cry for joy. It's just so beautiful. No writer, no composer could ever express all the beauty of this place. This lake is not only a delight for the eyes. You can feel in your heart that this is like a resting place for the gods and goddesses. The effects of climate change are even more visible in the Himalayas than elsewhere. In 2014, Gia was hit hard by a sudden flood. The glacier upstream from the village is receding and a pocket of meltwater formed. When it gave way, the torrent destroyed everything in its path and swept away the village's only bridge. Urgan, Stanzin's brother, was there. He was the one who gave the alert. It was around 11 o'clock at night. The water hadn't risen yet, but I noticed a strange smell. Then later, around midnight, I heard an enormous noise. The water started rising, and it kept rising. Around four in the morning, the water had risen above the bridge, and it was cascading over it. After a while, half the bridge was torn away, and the force of the water ripped away the banks. Stanzin was alerted by his brother during the night and arrived at the village early in the morning. Helpless before the raging elements, he took out his camera to have a record of the disaster. Before, our village of Gia, and even the entire region of the Himalayas, was a real paradise. There were no problems. The people had a good life. They lived in harmony with their land, so they weren't afraid of the climate. Now, every year, in 2002, 2003, 2004, and especially in 2010, there were natural disasters and it's getting worse. It's becoming dangerous here. People are worried about floods every summer. When will my house be wrecked? When will my cattle die? I'm afraid too, like all the Ladakhis. It's really starting to prey on our minds. How can we come up with a solution to the climate problem? The family house was spared by the flood of 2014. Stanzen comes home to his village, far from the bustling capital where he lives half the time, to enjoy the peace and quiet. Here, in the cocoon of his childhood, he finds the inspiration for his film projects. It's not easy living everyday life with one foot in the modern world and one foot in tradition. I'm not the only one who feels torn like this. A lot of Ladakhis feel somewhat lost. If you live your life respecting the traditions, you miss out on the modern world. And if you live in the modern world, you lose the traditions. There's a huge question mark between these two worlds.
Making documentaries is Stanzen's way of finding a balance between present day and traditional Ladakh. His extraordinary destiny has taken him traveling, in his childhood when he was a shepherd with his sister, then later abroad to international film festivals. But Stanzen has never forgotten where he comes from. His sister is still a shepherdess. As a tribute to her, he made her the subject of one of his documentaries, The Shepherdess of the Glaciers. Today, Stanzen is going to give his sister a surprise. He's going to show her the film for the first time. Thanks to my camera, I can transmit the beauty of Ladakh and the Himalayan mountains, the beauty of its people. I've been very lucky in becoming the first Ladakhi to make documentary films. Many films have already been shot here, but since I grew up here, I can do an even better job of capturing the traditional ways of life, the culture, and art of my region. I'm proud to be Ladakhi. His sister, Tsering, is still living with her flock a half-day's hike from the village. The only human being in these rugged mountains 4,500 meters up, she is one of the village's last shepherds. I'm so glad to see you. How are you, my sister? Great. What about you? Good, yeah. Not too tired? No, I'm, I'm fine. You don't get bored all alone? No. Yeah. Let's go have some tea. You have a good trip? I surprised you, didn't I? I was wondering who it was in the distance. I didn't recognize you. Tsering lives in her tent year-round. In winter, the temperature can drop to minus 40 degrees Celsius. This wild region is home to wolves and snow leopards. It takes an enormous strength of character to live in such a rugged, isolated spot. Hey, Bennett. You want to see it? Yes. How did it turn out? You'll see. It's the film I did about you, remember? Yes, I remember. I'll show it to you on my computer. Come on, watch the film. <laughs> Look, it's your film. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I'm shy. Don't be embarrassed. Look, it's beautiful. <laughs> Ah, oh, come on, don't cry.
my little baby goats. They're like your little children, huh? Yes, they're so cute. I love them. I can't believe that's me. It's as if it was some other woman. Why? Shepherding is a very hard job, it's true. But even if the younger generation goes to school now, we'll always need shepherds. People say, I have a degree, I don't want to be a shepherd because the working conditions are too harsh. But it's not good for anyone if there are no more shepherds. I don't know what others think about me, but deep down, I think that even after you get a good education, you can still choose to exercise this profession because it's so rich and it's indispensable for everyone. <laughs> As he accompanies his sister with her flock, Stanzin is taken back to his childhood. He remembers all the special moments he shared with Zering. From his vantage point up in these mountains, Stanzin can measure just how far he has come in life. There's one very important thing. We are made of flesh and blood. It's like a house. Over time it ages and falls into ruins. Eventually, we all pass away. Everything I filmed with my camera will remain, and they'll be able to show it to future generations. It's a testimony. That is why I'm a filmmaker. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, ye